So if you're a junior developer, you're probably writing your RESTful APIs the wrong way. I know a lot of you actually are back-end developers or either front-end developers who love to write RESTful APIs and actually be a big part of your workflow. But do you know all the best practices and what you should avoid or do when writing RESTful APIs, whether in Node.js, Express, or any other type of language? So in this video, I'm going to see what are the wrong ways to write RESTful APIs and how you should completely avoid that. So before we jump to this video, I'm just going to tell you that these guidelines that the advice you're going to see in this video are heavily inspired by the Microsoft API guidelines. So if you go to GitHub in here, Microsoft has a REST API guidelines for their internal team and for other public team that are publishing GitHub and you can use them. And those guidelines are very specifically made for REST APIs. They're pretty good. They have a lot, a lot of stuff. So I really advise you guys to go ahead and like read throughout this and actually understand everything that's going on in here and read some behind. So these are the five mistakes that you're probably doing wrong in whenever you're trying to actually make or write your own RESTful APIs and what are the best advices to completely avoid those. So starting with naming conventions. So naming your APIs is a really, really big deal. Either it actually makes your APIs look simpler and easier to read, either for your team who maintains the code or for consumers who are gonna be using the API at the end. So for example, in here for a bad practice, for example, you don't want to use verbs on the API endpoints itself. For example, in here, when you try to get posts, you don't do get post. Here you're using a kind of a verb and you just like, you know, concatenating that with a name. You don't want to do that. You only want to use proper names and the name should be pluralized. So it could be something like post and that's it. You just do forward slash, this is the endpoint. And this simply insinuates that, oh, this API is going to return all the arrays and posts that are in the database. For example, here, instead of doing post by ID, which is a very complicated name and it makes it super hard to do that, you want to use parameters. And this is actually the main thing why RESTful APIs allows parameters this way. So you do post and you make sure this is still with Perler. When you provide an ID, so a per, like a forward slash, then there's actually the parameter ID that tells it, oh, I want to find a post by this particular ID. Another wrong thing in here is adding v1 or versioning at the end of the endpoint. Instead of doing that, you should actually prepend the v1. For example, in here, this is the router. And when we do the API, so it's actually the, you know, we're just like prepending this one. So it goes like API forward slash v1. Then it comes to this, for example, forward slash post. So it's always prepended. Whenever you want to add another version, it's very easy for you to add that v2 and v3 and so on. And if it's something like this, you don't want to do that either. You just want to do like, for example, post, you want to find a post by ID and user in here is taking ways that you're going to return the user for that particular post. So the forward slash in here always indicates the hierarchical relationship between the different entities you're actually exposing throughout your API. And for example, you've got like a complicated name like this one where it's store inventory. You can't actually use capital letters in an actual API or a URL because this is going to end up in a URL eventually. So what else you can do is actually use a hyphen or a dash in here. So this will make the API a little bit more readable and easier to tell exactly what this one is going on instead of just leaving it like this or just even with the lowercase thing. The second most important thing are HTTP methods. So if you don't know already, HTTP methods are put there to insinuate and actually differentiate between what each operation is going to do and what each endpoint is going to accept and do. So for example, in here, instead of using a git method for all of your stuff in here and actually only changing the endpoint. For example, here, you're fetching users, that's fine. You're fetching users by ID, that's fine. Here, you're actually adding or creating a new user, but you're still using a GET request. That doesn't make sense. Or either maybe you're deleting or updating and you're still using GET and you're just like adding this to the endpoint. No, that's a very bad approach. What well, instead you would do for GET in here, obviously just when I just do get in here as simple as that, but for all those stuff, you want to use the appropriate HTTP method for it. So for example, here, for creating a new user, you want to use post for deleting an actual user, we're going to use deletes and all the endpoints in here are actually the same. So the only thing that differentiates between those APIs and those handlers is actually the HTTP method itself. So we use like, for example, post for creating delete method for deleting an actual user, actually you're going to provide the ID and stuff like that and put in here for updating a particular already existing user. For the third one, it's the status codes. So for example, if you go to the end real quickly in here, you're going to 
know that there is a bunch of status codes, HTTP status codes, and each range of status codes actually for a specific reason. So depending on your response from the server, you need to use the appropriate status code for the browser to know exactly what's happening, for the end user, for like a CDN or a cache you're using in the middle, or anything else that will make it work the perfect way it should be. So for example, you have know, client error responses in here, there's like 400 for a bad request that insinuates, oh, the client sent me a bad request that you should revise the payload and the payload that it just sent me is not accepted at all. Or maybe like, oh, 404 for a not found resource for a not found entity in the database or something like that. So for example, in here, what a lot of developers actually do, let's say, oh, you got a handler in here that actually fetches you a post by ID. So you go and look into the database in here using the post ID and stuff like that. If you find it, you're gonna return, oh, status 200, that's completely fine because you're just returning and you turn the actual post. That's good. But if you don't find this one, you go, oh, wrong. Or yeah, I'm gonna do a status 400 and remember, a 400 is for like a bad request that tells you, oh, user sent a bad request. But in this case, it's not exactly a bad request because the user sent an ID. And if the ID doesn't exist in the database, it's not a fault of the actual user. The user is still sending a right piece of data. So instead of returning 400 in here, we should return 404 for not found. So 404 in here would work perfectly with a message, no post found with provided ID. So for example, if we go to postman in here, I do request with, with ID one, that's good. It found this one. For, for example, if I use zero, which is not found, I still get status code 400 bad request. And if you change that to 404, I do another request in here. There you go. Now it says returns 404 for not found. And that's so perfect. And this actually applies to all the other status codes from 500 internal error into 200 and so on and so forth. The fourth thing that I see a lot of developers actually completely ignoring, especially new B developers, is caching. So if you look at the HTTP cache topic in the MDN documentation, you're going to know, oh, the HTTP cache stores a response associated with a request and reuse it, the stored response from subsequent requests. So that simply means when you actually do a request that basically looks like the previous request all the users are doing, and you have like cache, valid cache, either in a CDN or the browser itself, the server won't need to make a new response. The response is just going to be retrieved from the cache and the server is not going to be reached out anyway. And that is going to make our servers work so much better. It's going to serve more people and it's going to save us a lot of cost and time. And this is all done through the cache control header, which is a header that sends back to the browser and the CDN or whatever from the server itself, depending on the type of request and the response is actually sent in to tell it whether to cache or not. So for example, in here in caching for a bad usage is not using cache at all or not using it properly. Now, for a good approach, this is just an example for the current use case I'm having, which is just a blog that serves posts, and posts can be like published like per day or something. So, for example, here you do a middleware, a middleware called set cache that's going to say simply request response and next, an express middleware. And here we got a period. Period is actually in, in like seconds, 60 times five to get five minutes in seconds. And we simply in here do a quick check in. So, if it's a git method, which is what you should cache most of the times, you're gonna send back the cache control header to be public, so that could be cached pretty much by anyone, and you put the max age in here to be five minutes. So everything in here is gonna be cached for five minutes in the browser or in the CDN. If it's not, if it's like post, puts, or any other type of request, I don't wanna cache that, especially you wanna, like you don't wanna cache puts or post or delete stuff. So cache control in here should always be no stored. But yes, again, this should depend on your type of application. If you have a different type of application, the cache strategy and how you're handling cache should be different. And simply in here, last one is just called next, and we use that set cache middleware. So Express is gonna use that for every single time a new request is gonna make to the server. And if it's get request, I'm just gonna cache that out. And this is gonna make it super, super fast for us. So I really advise you guys to go ahead and check how caching works and how the cache control header actually works and all the stuff that goes inside of it to make a better, to make your APIs, to make your APIs more reliable and faster. And last thing in here, is optimization. And there's actually quite a lot of stuff that goes inside of the optimization topic for RESTful APIs in general. But one of the most important parts is trying to reduce the number of HTTP requests or RESTful API requests for getting a single piece of data that is related together. Let me show you what I mean. So in our database in here, what we got, we got an user and we got a post. And each post in here has an author. And the author in here is gonna be like an user. So it has a relation with the user in here. And the relation here is gonna be saved in the author ID. So the user ID in here is gonna be saved in the author ID. 
So simply, each post will have one author. Now, let's say we got an API in here where the user is simply going to get, get like a post, an array of posts. So we want to display our post in home page or something or in a search page. So what we're doing in here, oh, we find post, we do find many, and we say, oh, if it's published, you're going to return that. And simply, we're returning posts. But this is not very well optimized. So if we go to our post menu in here and try to test the API by sending a request, getting a post, we return three posts in here, which are in the database. And as close in here, it doesn't return the author, but instead, it returns the author ID. So when we try to display the posts in our homepage, web application, mobile application, or anything, when we try to do that, it tries to display the author information like the author name, rating, I don't know, um, the author profile URL, something related to the author itself, we can't do that. What we have to do is actually to go ahead and do another HTTP request, providing it that author ID in here in order to be able to fetch that information for that particular post. So here, if we have like three posts, we're going to be doing another extra three HTTP more requests to actually get every single post in here to get the author information of that particular post, which is pretty bad. So this is actually what we're going to do in here is like, oh, go to users. We provide the user ID in here that got from the author ID. So if you go to users and try to fetch a single user, that's going to happen. So we just do users, provide the author ID, and we're going to get the info eventually. Now, what we should do for an optimized way to handle that is actually when we try to fetch posts, we do this include, which is for the Prisma ORM in here. So it depends on your type of ORM or database you're using. But this simply what's going to do is actually going to include the author data. So it's going to go and do another database request to fetch the author data. It's going to encode it into this post in here for every single post. They're going to be like an author object that has all the information of our user or the author of the post eventually, and it's going to return that. So if we're going to try this out again, we do another request. There you go. We still get the author ID, but now we've got another object called author that has all the information of the author, the same info we would get when we do a separate request for getting a single user. And this will save us three more HTTP requests, and you can count more if you have more posts, and you can imagine how useful that is. So anyway, guys, thank you guys for watching. Hope you guys enjoyed, and now hope you guys can write your RESTful APIs the right way.